Hey guys, welcome back. It's time for more atoms and solids. Um, we're going to begin with carbon. So we started talking about uh, boron and carbon and nitrogen, and this stuff is uh, endlessly entertaining. So uh, I wanted to, there were numerous questions that were asked during class last time, and I wanted to uh, take a few minutes to tell you the kind of the real story of how this stuff works. We're going to need it anyway later when we get to perturbation theory. So I figure why not get it done now? So that's the idea. So talking about carbon, uh, it's got a helium shell, and then it's got a filled 2s shell, and then a partially filled 2p shell, only two electrons there. And what I want to point out is that you can understand what's going on with carbon completely only by working out the detailed angular momentum states involved. So. Let's remind ourselves how that works. First, I want to remind you of this table from Chapter 4. It's the terrible and hideous Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. Uh, you basically need these guys anytime you need to add two angular momenta together. And I'm going to explain to you how you can compute them yourself if you feel like it. But they're difficult enough to compute, and they're used often enough that uh, enterprising souls have created tables so that we don't have to compute them. That's the idea. But today we're adding two p electrons. Each p electron has an angular momentum of 1. We're adding those two angular momenta together to get a total angular momentum that could be 1 or 2 or could be 0. And the question is exactly how does that come about? Well, this table enables you to add two angular momenta together. You'll notice in the upper left-hand corner, there's a spin one-half plus a spin one-half. And uh, you'll recognize that table from Chapter 4. We, we used it to get the two possible total angular momentum states for uh, spin one-half, and th that was 1 and 0. There was a 1, one plus 1, 1, 0, 1 minus 1. And you'll notice that the vertical columns tell you how to compose the total spin, total angular momentum quantum states, and uh, you can see that 1, 1 is simply uh, both spins pointing up, plus 1 half, plus 1 half. But 1, 0 is uh, a superposition of plus 1 half, minus 1 half, and minus 1 half, plus 1 half, and they're added together. They're both positive. And finally, 1 minus 1 is both spins down, minus a half, minus a half. But the 0, 0 superposition, the singlet superposition, is plus, up, down, minus, down, up. And the fact that there are halves there means that you need to use coefficients of 1 over the square root of 2 and minus 1 over the square root of 2. So every coefficient ha is really square rooted. There's a little note about that at the top of the table. And also notice the notation. The total angular momentum states are labeled at the top in the horizontal direction, and the uh, angular momentum states that go into the superposition are labeled on the side in the vertical orientation. So uh, we'll see how that works here with the carbon. So let's focus on the 1 plus 1 situation. We're adding two angular momenta together, each of which has a magnitude of 1, to form angular momenta that have magnitudes of 0, 1, or 2. That's what that lower left-hand table does. Let's move some stuff out of the way here, and let's talk about the highest angular momentum state you could make, and that's the 2-2 two, two state. A total angular momentum of 2 with a z component of 2. The only way to make that is to make both angular momenta of the individual electrons plus 1. So you can see that uh, both of the 1 unit angular momenta are pointing up. Okay. Now, what if I want to know the 2, 1 state. In other words, it's got a total angular momentum of 2, but a z component of only 1. Uh, well, there's, there's two states of the individual electrons that could do that. There would be the 1, 0 plus the 1, 1, or the 1, 1 plus the 1, 0. But we don't know offhand what the superposition is going to be. Well, th to get that, we can apply the L minus operator. If you apply the L minus operator to the 2, 2 state, you'll get 2, 0. But you can see that you'll also get uh, 1, 0, plus 1, 1, and then you'll get plus 1, 1, 1, 0. So uh, let's see how that looks. It looks something like that. 
And you'll notice that the table tells you what the coefficient is on each of the individual eigenstates in order to make the total thing properly normalized. That's the idea. And properly weighted. So uh, <coughs> you could do this by hand by applying L minus, but somebody's already done it for you, and that's what this table is. What if you apply L minus again? Well, then you get a little bit of 1, 1, 1, 1 minus 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, and 1 minus 1, 1, 1. Notice these are the only combinations of the two uh, individual electron eigenstates that have a z component that adds up to 0. So you have to add a little bit of each of the possible combinations. And the fact that it turned out to be uh, in this proportion is due to the behavior of the L minus operator. You'll notice that there's two contributions to 1, 0, 1, 0, because I can hit L minus on the first electron in the first state of the 2, 1, or I can hit L minus on the second state of the 2, 1, on the second electron of the 2, 1. So there's two different ways to make that middle term, but there's only one way to make the outside terms. To, to make the first term, I have to hit L minus on the second electron of the first term of the 2, 1, and to make the last term, I have to hit L minus on the second term of the 2, 1, on the first electron of the 2, 1. Okay. Anyway, <coughs> if I hit L minus again, I get 2 minus 1. If I hit L minus again, I get 2 minus 2. And if I hit L minus on that one, I get nothing, because you can never have a z component that's greater in magnitude than the magnitude of the angular momentum itself. So I end up with five states uh, of total angular momentum 2 with the five possible z components. And you can see that those are composed of various combinations of the individual electron states. Now what I want you to look at is symmetry. If I swap the two electrons in any of these superpositions, uh, notice what happens. In the 2-2 state, obviously if I swap them, I end up back where I was. In the 2-1 state, I just exchange the two terms, but the total superposition remains unchanged. In the 2-0 state, if I swap the two, the first and the last terms change places. The middle term doesn't make any difference because it's they're both in the same state. And so you can see that um, no matter what I do, these guys are all symmetric under interchange of the two particles. So it, they're no good if I'm looking for an anti-symmetric state. In the state of carbon, we want the maximum spin, and the maximum spin occurs in the triplet. The triplet is uh, symmetric, and so I need the spatial part of the wave function, the angular momentum part of the wave function, has to be anti-symmetric, and you can see that uh, these guys are all symmetric, so it's no good. The L equals 2 cannot be used for carbon. So I've got to look further. So let's figure out what is the, uh, what about the angular momentum of 1 states. Now, in this case, uh, I need to, the maximum z component of angular momentum I can get, if the total angular momentum is 1, is 1, 1. So I've got to start with the 1, 1, and it's got to be orthogonal to the 2, 1, and you can see that the only combination of 1, 1 and 1, 0, which is what I need to get a z component of 1 that's orthogonal to 2, 1, is the same thing with a minus sign. So 1, 1 has to be orthogonal to 2, 1. If I apply L minus to that, I get 1, 0. If I apply L minus to that, I get 1, minus 1. Now I want you to look at these three states and notice what happens when I interchange particles. They all have anti-symmetry. That is, the, under interchange of the two particles, they are anti-symmetric, so they satisfy the Pauli exclusion, or the, uh, yeah, the Pauli exclusion principle. Since we have a symmetric spin state, we need an anti-symmetric spatial wave function, and these guys do it. Just for completeness, I'll go ahead and uh, try to figure out what is the 0, 0 state, because there is a 0, 0 state in this system. You can see from the Klebsch-Gordon coefficient table, it's, um, it's got to be that superposition. You know that it has to be orthogonal to both 1, 0 and 2, 0, and, uh, it, but it's got to be a superposition of these three states, and so it turns out this is the only orthogonal combination of 1, minus 1, 0, 0, and minus 1, 1 that's, uh, that's orthogonal to 1, 0 and to 2, 0. So that's the idea. Um, and that's why carbon ends up with L equals 1, not L equals 2. And, uh, and since it's half full, 
it means that J has to be um, L minus S. S is 1, L is 1, so I think J turns out to be 0 in carbon. But uh, I don't have that slide in front of me, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not positive of that. But that, that's basically how it works. Okay, so uh, what about nitrogen? Well, for nitrogen, we've got three electrons. And what I'd like to do is to point out that uh, we can use our understanding of the carbon situation to work out nitrogen. So let's see how that turns out. For, first of all, I want to point out that there's an easy way to construct an anti-symmetric wave function in general. It's called a Slater determinant. So if I have a bunch of quantum states, A, B, C, D, E, and I have a bunch of particles, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or whatever, and I want to form an anti a totally anti-symmetric combination of the wave functions using those particles, I can form what's called a Slater determinant. I put the wave functions in the columns, and I put the particles in the rows, and then I uh, just simply calculate this determinant. So for example, if we want to put three electrons in the L equals one state, uh, but with different values of m sub l, 1, 0, and minus 1, we would, uh, we'd put them in something like this. So that would mean, what have I got? I've got uh, electron 1 in uh, the plus state, electron 1 in the 0 state, electron 1 in the minus 1 state is the first row. The second row is electron 2 in the up, electron 2 in the 0, electron 2 in the down, and so on. If I multiply all that out and use the normal rules of matrix algebra, okay, I get uh, the first electron is up, and I multiply that by the second electron is at zero, the third electron is at minus one, minus the second electron is at minus one, and the third electron is at zero. And I uh, do that for all three rows using the normal rules of matrix of determinant calculation or whatever. Now I can uh, go ahead and multiply that all out, and I get this hideous mess. But uh, basically, it tells you that there is a superposition of the three electron states that is totally anti-symmetric. And this would be the spatial part of the wave function, because the uh, spin part is going to be symmetric in view of the fact that we've maximized the spin. All three spins have to be up, and there's on then the only way to make all three spins up is if it's symmetric. So, uh, so that's one way to calculate. But the question is, what's the angular momentum of that state? We know what the state is. That's got to be the angular momentum state of the three electrons. But, but it's hard to look at that and know what angular momentum it corresponds to. So what I want to point out is that uh, we can work out the, uh, I'm going to claim that that's the 0, 0 state, that that's the total angular momentum of 0 and a spin of 0. And what I want to show is that uh, we can use the um, Klebsch-Gordon coefficients to, to basically the approach we had before to demonstrate that. Let's see how that works. OK, so this is the 0, 0 state. Um, and we want to form this. Here's the idea. If we combine the first two electrons, we need them to be anti-symmetric. The only way to make the first two electrons anti-symmetric is if they're in a one L equals 1 state of some kind. Um, any L equals 1 state will be anti-symmetric. So the idea is if we let the first electron in this three electron set be the first slot in the 0, 0 state, and let the second slot be filled by the two electrons forming an L equals 1 state together. So the idea is the last two electrons, we know, have to be in some superposition of 1, 1, 1, minus 1, and 1, 0, because those are the only anti-symmetric states that we can track down. And we put those in as the second angular momentum in the full three electron zero zero state. Okay? That's the idea. And we notice that if you go back and look at the determinant structure from the Slater determinant, what do you get? You get um, the uh, first electron 
in the 1 state, the second electron in the 0 state, the third electron in the negative state. But um, if you look at what you get from the first term of this overall superposition, we get the first electron in the 1 state, the second electron in the zero state, and the third electron in the minus one state. That would be the result of plugging the one minus one of the two electrons into the first term of the zero, zero. And uh, notice that the one over the square roots of two and the one over the square roots of three multiply to give us the one over the square root of six in the original Slater determinant. So uh, we haven't exactly proved this is the only way to do it, although it does turn out to be that way. Um, but it at least demonstrates that uh, what we have constructed using the Slater determinant is in fact a zero zero state made up of the uh, first electron in a superposition of one 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 zero and one minus one and the other two electrons in superpositions of one 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 zero and one minus one themselves so that the total angular momentum ends up being zero. So this would be the so-called jackknife situation. If you multiply it all out, you get exactly the same thing we had before. Okay, so that is why, or that is one way to look at the reason nitrogen ends up being an orbital angular momentum of zero, carbon ends up being an orbital angular momentum of one. And uh, I know this stuff is nuts. We will get better at it as we get more practice. Okay. Let's talk about a periodic potential. One way to make a periodic potential in one dimension is just as a superposition of delta function potentials. We had some experience with delta function potentials last semester in chapter two. Um, within a unit cell, there is no potential at all. So we're just talking about a free particle. That means that it needs to be some kind of superposition of sine and cosine. There's a thing called Bloch's theorem, which says that if you have a periodic potential, the wave function in any other place has to be periodic. In other words, if you've got the wave function at point x and you want to know what it is one unit spacing away, you can take the wave function at point x and just multiply it by this complex exponential using a real value of capital K. So capital K is sometimes called the crystal momentum. It's uh, it's produced by solving a transcendental equation typically and we're going to see how that comes out if we if you apply the boundary conditions at the delta function just like we did in chapter two you end up with an equation that looks like this um, and notice that this means that uh, if you tell me capital K I can solve this transcendental equation to find a little k uh, or the other way around if I solve this transcendental equation if I put in a little k this tells me capital K so this gives me a relationship between the crystal momentum and the k value, but the k value is uh, determines the energy, right? Determines the energy of the thing. So uh, of course Griffiths likes to parameterize these things, so he defines ka to be z, and he defines m alpha a over h bar squared to be beta. So beta is a measure of the strength of the potential and the crystal spacing, the unit cell spacing. Um, you can think of it as a strength parameter, a geometry parameter. And uh, Z, of course, is related to the energy. So let's, uh, let's do a little demo to see how this equation actually produces solutions. OK, so this is the <coughs> equation that Griffiths comes up with. This is the equation for the, the, uh, the cosine of capital K times A. And I'm letting x be Griffith's z, which is little k times a. And uh, you notice the function is a cosine. And then it's the sine of x divided by x, which uh, sometimes is called a sinc function. But it's the sum of those two guys that has to be equal to the cosine of big k times a. And I've got a dial here where I can adjust the value of beta. So I can make beta big and small. One thing to notice is that if beta is zero, that means that I get rid of the potential altogether, that the function stays always within the bounds of minus one and plus one, which means there are solutions for all values of little k. But if beta gets to be big, notice that the function grows. I think Griffiths uses 10 in, in the book, in the diagram in the book. 
Um, <clears throat> in that case, this function exceeds the bounds of minus 1 and 1, and there's no value of capital K that can match the value of this function. And so these points where the function exceeds 1 or mi minus 1 are forbidden. There is no solution in that region. And since the energy depends on little k, that means that these are regions of uh, forbidden energy in the final system. Uh, and so this is what gives rise to the so-called gaps. So in a real solid, there are energy gaps that uh, electrons in those solids aren't allowed to occupy. And those gaps uh, have to, if, if let's say we have a band of energy levels, so the set of solutions, since the capital K is quantized to have only particular values, um, in the periodic boundary conditions, uh, basically n times the uh, k times the lattice spacing has to be 1. So uh, that means that's not quite right. It has to be an integer. So uh, it means that capital K has, it has a discrete set of possible values. So you can imagine if you zoomed in here, a set of horizontal values here of k that would correspond, of big k, that would correspond to solutions that have a certain value of little k. And so this, this range of values of little k between here and here corresponds to a band of energies, and then there's a gap, and there's another band of energies, and there's a gap, there's another band of energies. In a real solid, if you have a band that's full of electrons and a band that is empty of electrons, then in order to get from the full band to the empty band, which are, happen to be called the conduction band and the valence band, for example, you have to jump across a gap. In an insulator, uh, that gap is big, and because this band is full, all the positive and negative k values are gobbled up, there's no possibility of conduction, you'd end up with an insulator. Um, if the gap is not too big, then you have a semiconductor, and if there is no gap, um, or if a band is half full, um, then you'd have a metal. So because th there would be no energy required to go from uh, <coughs> a full band to, well, a full state to an empty state. Anyway, that's the idea. Now, the question is, what do these bands actually look like? Uh, so I cooked up a little Python program. Here is the function that you recognize, and I went ahead and took its derivative. So this is the derivative of the function. And I started out, I just picked some z values that were convenient. I create an array of n values that goes from minus n over 2 to plus n over 2. I picked n to be 1,000. And then I created the uh, large k, I'm going to call it kappa, the large k array, to be integer multiples of 2 pi over big N. And the idea is that uh, uh, these are going to be crystal momenta, so-called crystal momenta. Then, I don't know if you're familiar with Newton's method. It's a way of finding zeros. You basically, uh, we, we can talk about it a little bit in class if you have questions. But basically, you give, you give it a function and the value you want that function to have. You pass in the, the derivative of the function, the function primed, the uh, uncertainty you're permitting the, or the difference between the value of the function that you're willing to uh, permit, and then a starting place to evaluate the function. And basically what you do is you evaluate the function at the starting place, you figure out its derivative at that location, and you project where, what z would have to be in order to make its value zero, assuming that that derivative is, is good. Uh, then you reevaluate and keep going, and you just keep it keep uh, zooming in until you find the place where the function is very, very nearly equal to the value that you wish. As long as the derivative doesn't go to zero, the thing is pretty well behaved. Um, if the derivative goes to zero or becomes very small, it's, it's not so good. But it turns out it's okay for this application. And uh, then what I'm going to do is go through all the values of kappa and calculate the cosine of kappa times a and then use Newton's method to find the value of z that satisfies the transcendental equation, and then calculate the energy at that location and throw it in a list, and then we can graph it. Then we're going to graph kappa versus the energy for the three bands. Let's see, let's see how that goes. If we run the program, we get this is the energy for the uh, 
lowest energy band, and then here's the next energy band, and here's the highest energy band. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that if I zoom in here and look at this energy band right around the origin, so I'll have to zoom in twice probably. There you go. You can see that near the origin, this thing is very nearly quadratic. And what that means is um, the energy goes like k squared, which is the correct behavior for a free particle. So for low energies in this band, the energy of the electron in the band is very nearly the same as a free particle. But when you go out to higher energies, the, uh, the behavior changes and you don't have free particle behavior. So what this means is, is the, as k gets bigger, the energy increases uh, in a quadratic way. Here, as k gets close to a band edge, it starts to behave kind of strangely, where it sort of maxes out. Um, and here, if you are in this band, as k gets bigger, the energy actually drops. So that's uh, quite strange. And uh, you'll have to take a course on solid state physics to understand what all that means. But it's fun to think about. And uh, if you have questions, of course, I'm, I'm totally happy to talk. Anyway, I think that's all for today. So we'll see you guys next time.